good morning, everyone. Uh, wanted to kick off the panel session for today. And again, wanted to thank all of you here for joining us um, on your Saturday morning. So um, to kick it off, um, what I'd like to do is just introduce myself. Um, I have the privilege of moderating these wonderful ladies on stage today. My name is Joyce Chen. Uh, I'd like to call myself someone very curious about life, constantly wanderlusting, but I'm also the marketing director on uh, Lamarca Prosecco. Uh, when I'm not working at the winery, um, I'm actually also a certified life coach. So I'm also doing coaching on the side, um, being trying to be the best mom I can to my fur baby. That's a Frenchie. Um, that is a real thing, by the way, I think. And I love that you guys talk about that on the Every Girl, being a fur mom. That's like a real deal. Um, real deal. Um, they can't talk just like babies um, in their first, well, I guess for their, their whole lives. But anyways, uh, besides the point, I digress. Um, but I'm really excited here to be able to talk through some real conversations with some of these ladies. I think we're all in the process right now of conquering our careers, right, would you say? And it's a constantly evolving challenge that we go through, and these women absolutely represent that as well. So the hope in today is that you'll get some lessons from all of them on stage, because um, they themselves have gone through their own rise and their own falls, and our hope is to share some tips with you. I know there's a lot of bad press sometimes about women rising, and we all gotta do it together, but I just wanna take the time for us to celebrate how awesome this generation is, especially when it comes to rising. So here's some stats, because all of you guys in this room represent these stats. So today, women-owned businesses are growing five times faster than the national average. And some of you guys are contributing to that. I know, that gets a clap. I love that. Um, second, African-American women have become the fastest growing group of entrepreneurs in the US, which is pretty amazing. So let's clap to that. This one was actually really fun. This shocked me. So in households that have children under the age of 18, did you know 40% of US households, women are the primary uh, income provider for those households, which is also pretty amazing. Um, since millennials have been born, which is very exciting, um, the number of women earning degrees has quadrupled since that time which is amazing. This is one of the most educated generations we've ever seen, which is exciting. And then lastly, this is my favorite. Millennial women are dominating the current job market with more than two thirds of young women in the workforce today. And that's up 50, from 50% 50 in 1975, which is a huge accomplishment. So before we get started, can you all give yourselves a, a round of applause? Um, because I think those stats are pretty amazing, and that's with every girl in this room here, which is pretty amazing. So with all that good news and all the rise of women today, there is some bad news. We're just going to keep it small, though. Um, some of the things that we see in the news today and some of the things that women actually need the most today in their careers are three things. The first is funding, especially for entrepreneurs and startups. The second is actually mentorship. And the third is support. And I know when I read that stat, I was shocked. The funding piece, I knew. But the mentorship and support, I just think about my girlfriends and my family, and we're all there for each other. How could this be something that we still need? And it dawned on me that that's exactly why we ended up doing this conference between Lamarca and The Every Girl, is we realized we need, and you said it earlier, Elena, we need each other. And we need to help each other, and we need each other to rise. So that's the goal today, and that's why we have the panelists that we have on stage today. So I'd like to introduce them, um, well, and to address those three things. Uh, from a funding perspective, I'm sorry to break it to you, we will not be handing out cash today, <laughs> but there's plenty Prosecco. Um, mentorship, again, take advantage of the networking hour so you can meet new people here within your area. And then um, in terms of support, we hope that you'll learn from these ladies today. So starting off, I'd love to introduce um, our panelists. So let's start off with Miss Coco Bassi over here. Coco. Uh, Coco is a fierce woman and also a cancer survivor. She is a marketing professional that works in the corporate world, um, but she also has a side hustle. She is the owner and founder of Millennial.com, a blog, a lifestyle blog focused, to being, focused on being a millennial woman in today's world. 
Um, to the left of me, I've got Katherine Anderson. I might just call you Kath because I feel like we're on that we're on that level already. Um, Catherine is very very impressive. She is currently in charge of policy communications over at Facebook, and she spent the past decade working in companies such as Google and Apple. And so she's got a lot of great corporate tips and experience for us. Then over to my right, I've got Miss Maddie James, and Maddie James, she is the so. Those of you who understand that influencer and blogger is now a career, that's a thing. That's Miss Maddie over here. So uh, Maddie James is, maddiejames.com is a lifestyle blog. And Maddie literally just took her passion for blogging and turned it into a career. And that is her full-time job, which is very exciting. And then to the right of her, we have Miss Allison Tr Trammell. Um, what is unique about Allison, she made a huge career shift. She had a path here, and then she'd made a hard right, um, which landed her over at the Every Girl. So I think she's going to have some great lessons about when it's time to pursue your dream. And then lastly, we have the great Elena Kesmarski. And Elena is one of the co-founders of Every Girl. And what's really exciting is I think Elena is a great example of the courage that it takes to just go after it and go get it. And that's what started the Every Girl along with her best friend, Danielle Moss. So uh, to start off, uh, what I'd like to say is thank you, ladies. I thought at some point in my life, my dream job was to be a journalist, in case anyone wanted to know. So I feel like this kind of satisfies that. I thought I'd be on CNN, but you know what? The every girl works just as well. So um, Elena, I'm actually going to start with you over on the right, because I think it's appropriate kickoff for this event. So you were 26, year old, 26 years old. Um, when you and Danielle teamed up to launch The Every Girl in 2012. I think you were two years out of college. You probably were like, what the heck do I do? I think you had just moved. And now The Every Girl reaches two million readers each month with over 50 million page views. I can only imagine, and then you also launched the everymom.com last year, which is exciting as well. Yes. So I can only imagine that journey, A, was exciting and also potentially very terrifying. Um, can you tell us, how did you get over that fear of just saying, you know what, I'm going to go for it, I'm going to pursue that dream job, versus playing it safe and doing what you knew would be predictable? Um, thank you for all of that. <laughs> so, yeah, gosh, looking back at the beginning, can you all hear me out? Is this close enough? Okay. Um, the beginning was interesting, and it should be stated that what quelled the fear was maintaining a full-time job with a paycheck for the first, I think, year and a half, um, going into ch first year and a half of launching and running the Every Girl. So Danielle and I were, and Danielle was working for herself, but like had maintained her full-time job. Um, so we were working, we'd be up early, and then I, from nine to five, would log in. I, I did work from home, which helped a lot. Um, I'd log in to my other full-time job. And then I'd be at my computer again till midnight or one, and then working on the weekends for the first year and a half. It was a grind. Um, I loved it, so it didn't feel like work, uh, which is the best part of ever pursuing a career you're passionate about. It doesn't feel like work. Um, so that really helped quell the fear. Um, it also should just be stated that going into journalism was the bigger <laughs> risk, I guess, according to my parents. Um, you know, instead of going the more secure corporate or medical or legal, like any of those traditional fields that I think our parents' generation were kind of raised to think as stable and, you know, your sure bet, um, wanting to go into journalism itself was going to be the big risk. So I was said to someone earlier, little did I know, I was trying to pursue magazine journalism at a time when all the magazines were folding. I had no way of knowing that the shift toward online media would be what it was going to be. Um, and we didn't know what we were doing at the beginning. I remember my dad being like, how are you guys going to make money? And I was like, you know what? Ads. <laughs> I don't think we had an ad on our site for years. <laughs> like the whole shift of influencer marketing, like that didn't come for two, two, three years into it. So it was a learning curve, but we loved what we were doing. And more so we saw the response. We knew there was a need for it. We didn't know how it was going to shape out, but um, just the response from readers uh, and then some press we got very early on. We were named a top website for women by Forbes four months after we launched, and we were like, okay, 
we're on to something. Like, yeah, we're not making any money yet, but we're going to stick with this and see where it goes. So, so did not make any, making any money scare you? And, like, how did you specifically get over that fear? Were there any things? Was it self-talk? Was it um, praying to the money gods? I, mean, I think I it scared me because we didn't know when it would come, if it would keep coming. That was the big fear year over year. We've always been very conservative with neither of us have a finance degree or an accounting degree. We're both creative minds. Um, so we've always been conservative, not knowing what the next year might look like, not knowing what the next month might look like. Um, so I just think like having not necessarily a backup plan, but save, so, like if, you're, if you don't wanna do two jobs, but you know you wanna do something different, my best advice is like save aggressively. Put yourself in a position where you can take that six month leap um, or if you're working a part-time job while trying to, you know, we, we've all been there, so you need bills, to, or you need to pay the bills. Um, I get that, so it is a grind at the beginning, but if you love it, ultimately, like, like I said, it doesn't feel like work, um, and it, it definitely, you know, pays off yeah. when, when you love what you're doing, and, and you're hearing from the people you're trying to put it out there for that they're loving it as well, so that's when you know you're onto something. That's awesome, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, Maddie, I'm going to jump to you because you literally took a passion of blogging for seven years and said, I'm just going to, I'm going to figure it out, make it a full-time job. So can you share with us maybe two, three important tips in starting your own blog and starting your own business? Because I'm sure there are several women here who are interested in doing that. So yeah, I have been blogging since back in the day in 2009 and, you know, I, was, I really started it out as a hobby. I loved it. I lived in New York before I moved here. So like in 2006, I was like, what is this celebrity you know, blogging thing? And that's why I started getting all of my celebrity news and moved to Atlanta, was working retail, which I don't wish on a war criminal. Um, it's just a really bad schedule situation, but anyhow. Um, and I got engaged and I was like, well, I don't wanna start my life as a woman, you know, doing all of, you know, still working retail. So started blogging a little bit more consistently. And I think that definitely taught me a lesson, like really treating it as a hobby and it's like, oh, it's fun, it's light. But then really shifting to like, okay, I want this to turn into something, you know what I mean? Um, similar to what Alana said, it's like, uh, you know, you're not making any money, but <laughs> you, you hope that it comes. So that consistency was really important. And then once I started like, because I really consistent for me started out like two to three times a week. And so versus like two to three times a month. And then after being consistent, what I realized is that, you know, when you first start out blogging, you really mimic people you like and respect. And, you know, that really wasn't working for me because people didn't want to hear about celebrity news for me. <laughs> they just didn't. And I enjoyed digesting celebrity news. That's not what I wanted to put out there. So I started talking about my life, what I bought from H&M, what I did this weekend, and it, like doubled my traffic. And I was like, oh, they just want to know about this regular girl from Atlanta. So really finding my voice was huge. And I know that sounds so cliche, but that's so important because then you really start to understand what your value is as a content creator because you're like, oh, this is what makes me stand out. This is what makes me unique. Even if I am talking about personal style, like thousands of other women, I'm talking about it from my perspective. And that is really huge. And then I think lastly, I think it's about starting to think about it as a long-term goal, at least for me, because I knew that I wanted to quit my nine to five. I did not want to work there anymore. And I was like, okay, what does this actually mean? How do I create streams of income? Do I want to do sponsored things? Do I want to do ads? Do I, I didn't really know what that was, but I had to start getting really explicit with myself and say, this is what I'm willing to do. This is what I don't want to do. And once I kind of had that mindset, things really started coming together. I love that. So I think the three takeaways, and by the way, we are live streaming this. Uh, I forgot to mention that earlier. Um, and a lot of these questions, by the way, came from readers and you guys. But so I just wanted to recap some of your lessons. I think what I took away was, A, being authentic to you, not copying anyone else. Um, second, knowing your value. And then um, third, really putting together a long-term plan. I think those are great tips for, for starting off your blog. Um, so then what I'd love to do is then I'd love to move um, towards Coco. Um, because Coco, you're in the unique situation, very similar to how Elena started out, where you're literally, you, you've got the job and then you've got the side hustle. And that's not a, 
that's something that's actually very common for this generation. In fact, up to 51% of millennials today have a side hustle, um, which is interesting. Um, how do you balance that from a work-life perspective without working yourself into the ground? Um, can you guys hear me? I don't know if this is on. Okay, okay. Um, so for me, I would say that maintaining both First of all, yes, my blog is kind of a side hustle, but it's gotten to a point where it feels like I'm literally working two full-time jobs at this point. Um, and I think that every Monday morning, every morning I'm getting ready to go to work, it's kind of making that decision um, about how you want to commit your time. Uh, for me, like I started working with a brand manager and she's kind of someone that's on my team and we speak about where things are headed and like how I want to take, what direction I want my business to go in. And one of the first things she told me, like during um, one of our first meetings was, if it's important to you, you'll find time for it. And I think that's the one thing that I have always remembered, like out of all of the discussions we've had, at the end of the day, when I'm getting ready to go to work and I make that decision of, you know, I'm putting aside this much time when I get home to work on my blog or to crank out a proposal or whatever it is that I'm doing, it's a decision and it's really, you know, that means that something might suffer, whether it's, you know, on like the social end or if you feel like you'd rather kind of hang out on the couch and do like, and it's, it's always going to be that constant decision making. And for me, like my, my thought process about keeping both and I don't know, you know, in the long term how long I'm going to be keeping both, but for me it's always been because of the fact that I started in 2013, which was a few years after Maddie started. And I think by 2013, the influencer world had kind of taken off, definitely not to the point that it's at today, but I knew that there was an opportunity to make money out of it. So for me coming into that space, I wanted to do it well, right off the bat. I wanted to be able to create a space that, you know, both readers and brands would kind of see what it was I was doing and they would want to be a part of it. And so for me, from day one, I have always been able to make money at work and then invest that right back into my business. And I think that that's one of the things that really helped me to stand out starting in 2013, which now feels like a long time ago, but back in 2013, there were already a lot of very well established influencers. And I think being able to invest back into my business is what helped me to kind of hit the ground running really well. Yeah, I think that's great. And I love that you said you took that time to really make yourself stand out. And standing out is something that's really important. And I know that sometimes that's hard for us, right? It's, it's how do we brand ourselves? How do we stand out from a crowd and make sure people notice us, whether it's through advocacy um, or branding yourself? So um, I'd love to actually jump over to Miss Allison and have you tell us about um, branding yourself. So this is a fantastic story. Allison um, thought she was gonna be a school teacher. And then all of a sudden she said, nope, I'm gonna go do something else. That was her hard right. And she applied for an internship with the Every Girl. And out of 500 applicants, 500, she was the one that stood out as an intern. So I'm sure a lot of us, both in the corporate, <laughs> entrepreneurial, self-starter world, how the heck did you do that? And how did you make yourself stand out of the crowd? So what I learned from the job that I got before this, I was stuck in a rut of babysitting jobs, Target, Starbucks, those like food service jobs. And I was like, trying to get out of it and no one would read my application. I couldn't get an interview, couldn't do anything. And so I applied for this job in a physician's office and I was like, I just need to get to an office. If I can get to an office, I can get to the next office. And I was the only one that had no medical experience, no anything, and I sat down and I was like, no one will work harder for you than me. I may not know how to do it, but I will figure it out. And he looked at me and he was like, wow, you're hired. So then I was like, I got the first office. So then when it came to the Every Girl, I sent in my application the day they posted the job and then thought about it um, and stressed about it for a while. And I started thinking, I'm just one of many. Like, how am I going to stand out? So on a whim, the night before, I like got this idea. I was like, I'm going to be the last email that they get when they open their inbox the next morning how am I gonna stand out? And I wrote them this email that was like, basically, here's my application, here's 10 reasons why you need to hire me. Oh. And that was it, and I wrote this long letter, and you know those like middle of the night ideas that you get? <laughs> that in the light of day, you're like, wow, you were really bold last night. 
It was one of those. I made a whole graphic. I poured my heart out, and at 11.59, I hit send. And then I think I probably said, like, a million explicatives and then, like, stayed up all night. And it worked. And I think it's just about getting in front of the audience that you need to and saying what value you have. You may not have the experience. You may not have this. But now coming from a manager role where I'm now interviewing people to hire, I look for the person who is a self-starter, who wants to learn things. I didn't have any money to take any courses in there. I was living in a place where things and professional development weren't available to me. So I got on YouTube, I taught myself, and even if I didn't know how to do it, I was like, I will figure it out for you. And I think that as a manager now, I look for that and that spark yeah. and that drive more than I look at necessarily yeah. experience or a degree. That like grit and tenacity, yeah. like really yeah. stands yeah. out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Someone will say something in a meeting and I'm like, I don't know, but give me 30. And I'm gonna figure it out. I love that. And I think that tenacity is so great. And I, I love what you said again. It's like, know your value. That's something that Maddie also said. Like, you have to know your value of what you bring to the table. It's not about what you do, it's about who you are and what you know you can bring. And by the way, you only know yourself best. So, what I also love about your story is that was really courageous. And I'm so glad you shared like the freak out moment behind the scenes because everything's like, oh, it's so perfect. It's actually not. It's a series of things you experiment with. So that courageousness is awesome. I'd love to transfer over to Kath and talk about that courageousness in the corporate workplace because sometimes that's not always easy. And advocating for yourself can sometimes be really, really hard and very difficult. And how, how do you have the courage, A, to advocate for yourself? When do you know to do that? And then when do you know to use other people to advocate on your behalf as a way to brand yourself? Um, I think that's one of the hardest things, um, especially when you're new in your career, because you've been given a lot of advice. You have a lot of kind of tidbits of, and nuggets of advice coming from different people. And um, you kind of have to make a decision early on as to whether you're going to just absorb it all or you're going to start to kind of filter it. Um, but you don't really know, you don't have the judgment yet to know how to filter it. Um, and so I think, and I think the ad, on the advocacy side, you know, a lot of us probably, you know, are working on building our self-confidence and we're, you know, we go home at night and we're like, okay, like you got this tomorrow, you've got this interview or you've got this meeting, this presentation. But then you also, at least I know, I personally always worried about coming off as too confident. Um, and so I would sort of like fluctuate. There was almost this pendulum inside or at home um, later with my husband. <laughs> like, was this okay? Like, look at this email. Was this too like aggressive? Was this too, uh, because I care deeply about being me, being authentic. And I'm not a super aggressive person by nature. I'm a confident person. But because women are often branded as being overly aggressive when we, when we are sure about something, um, I struggled with that a lot. And then I like also was doing a lot of reading. I read Lean In when that came out. I felt really empowered by it, but I also like knew that there were people that were not so excited about it. And so, I mean, I actually think the Ever Girl has done an amazing job of capturing all this, but it was, it came a little bit later than my time. So I, I definitely struggled with that. I think a big part of it is, is context and environment. And I think as you enter a new workplace, doing a lot of listening initially is really key. And I'm definitely a talker, so sometimes listening is not my first instinct. And so I think I have to actually tell myself, even now, like I'm just starting out in a new role, and I have to be like, okay, listen, listen. Like you don't need to talk right away. You can, you can just take your time. Um, and then later you sort of have to decide, okay, strategically, like this is the right time to like advocate for myself and push hard. This is an opportunity or this is something I know I can do or do well. Um, and then other times you have to sort of ask the person who's your mentor, the person who's your boss to advocate on your behalf. And that's not always the easiest thing to do, but um, I think like there's a time and a place and um, I've actually done a lot of uh, sort of asking advice uh, of my friends around how to get the best advocacy. Um, like, do you think it's appropriate to ask this person to speak up for me or, um, and it might sound like you're, you're sort of asking for too much help, but yeah. I actually think that community advice is just critical and it's been instrumental for me personally. Yeah, I love that you bring that up on advocacy. I think leaning in on your community and having someone advocate on your behalf. But I think another great thing that you mentioned is 
going back to them and saying, hey, you advocate on my behalf, this is what I did, and showing them how their support had helped you, yeah. I think is, is huge, and I know that's something that you mentioned earlier, which is great, so. And then beginning to pass it forward, so, yes. you, you know, others do that for you, and then you can begin to kind of be that call that you're, you know, um, my, my sister's friends, as they're navigating their careers, will, will say like, hey, can I just chat for a minute about this like negotiation or do I take this job or not kind of thing. And yeah, it's almost like be a big sister to someone else yeah. And, yeah. and help them along. So Definitely. that's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Um, so now I want to shift into kind of, we've seen a lot of rise with women today, especially millennial women, which is awesome. But that also meant that there was a fall somewhere, right? We've all had it. Um, and I think we also get some great lessons when we look at the tough times and we look at the times where it wasn't perfect. Everyone here is in the process of conquering their career. Um, I'd actually love to start with you, Coco, if you can kind of walk us through a time or a moment where, you know, something unexpected happened, um, you were brought down. Like, how did you, how do you overcome that in your life in order to be a strong person personally and professionally? Yeah, so um, I guess... For that instance, I can talk a little bit about my cancer diagnosis and the treatment um, that I went through. And this was um, actually before I started my blog. I was in grad school, um, and it really came out of nowhere. <laughs> um, I had gotten sick, and I just went to the doctor for a regular checkup, and then kind of through that process, it turned out that they found a tumor, and then everything that kind of follows after that. Um, I think that year in general was really tough for me. I was in my final year at grad school, so working on my thesis. I was going through my cancer treatment, went through a breakup <laughs> later that year too. It was just awful. Um, I mean, I, th I think that I'm definitely luckier than most because it was caught really early. I didn't have to go through the really intense um, chemotherapy process, and it was thyroid cancer, so it was not, I guess, as you know, it, w it didn't get to a point that it was as serious as some other people have unfortunately experienced. But at the same time, too, I think, you know, every person's pain is still, you know, th their pain. Um, coming out of that, I think that was one of the really big things that prompted me to figure out what it was that I really wanted to do besides work, besides getting a, grad uh, a graduate degree. Um, and that was what kind of one of the things that prompted me to start a blog um, but in addition to that too it, uh, it also taught me a lot about taking care of yourself throughout the process I mean it's I think a lot of people take pride in working almost to the point of overworking and there is I mean at the end of the day there really are no awards for overworking yourself mm -hmm. I think it really always in, is in the results, and if you're able to find a way to work efficiently, like you'll still get the same result as someone who's overworking themselves to a point of you know, exhaustion and then getting that exact same result too. So for me, it's just been making sure that I'm taking care of myself. Um, and then just from a general standpoint, like living in like just this sense of gratitude. At the end of the day, I got another chance. And you know, last year I, have a f I had a friend who also, she was also an influencer. She was a really good friend of mine. We worked on a couple campaigns together, and she passed away last September from um, cancer, too. Um, and, you know, her situation doesn't make her any less special than I am, but I think at the end of the day, just kind of really coming from that place where, you know, you understand, hey, I have this chance. Like, even whether you did go through something major or not, when we're waking up in the morning, you know, you have a chance to do something awesome with yourself and just take that and run with it. I love that. And um, thank you so much for sharing that. I know we talked about it a little bit. And um, I think that's incredibly powerful, especially the tip that you mentioned about being grateful. And um, all of us in this room have a chance to really do something amazing, um, whether it's big or small. And so I think that's such a great lesson that you learned. And I'm sorry that it had to be uh, something so severe to, to help learn that lesson, but thank you for sharing that with the women um, in this room today. Uh, from a failure perspective, I mean, I know that that was a personal setback for you, that you had to deal with in your personal life and then protect your professional life. Um, Kath, I think you had some setbacks as well, more from a corporate professional perspective. Um, would love for you to just talk a little bit about how those setbacks or how those failures taught you to become the professional that you are today, especially in the corporate world. 
Yeah, I think failure has been like a consistent theme throughout my career. And it's one of those things that you don't see on someone's Instagram feed or on their LinkedIn. <laughs> they typically That's remove true. the failure parts. Um, so yeah, I mean, um, actually like a lot of people on this panel, I uh, was uh, planning to go into journalism um, when I was at BU, actually with my good friend Allie over here um, on the Evergirl team. So. Um, and I, uh, my junior summer, had an internship um, with a very big network television station in DC. Um, I moved into my aunt's basement. It was really glamorous. And then um, the internship <laughs> fell through. Uh, it was paid, so I was supposed to be using my salary to pay her to stay with my aunt, like to pay for food and stuff. And I found myself just like pretty, pretty desolate. Um, I spent a couple days in her basement and didn't come out. And then shot my resume out to like 70 different places and ended up with maybe two opportunities, one and a half, um, because most stuff was taken by then. It was late May. Um, but that one moment, actually, I ended up working in public affairs for the Pentagon. And it was the first time I even had considered PR or being on the other side of the phone call, you know, working with media. And I loved it, and I kind of never went back. So that was an early failure that I, I learned to navigate. But I've had many. Um, I continue to have them. I, I had a lot of ups and downs this past summer even. Um, not necessarily failures. Um, some of my friends, my biggest advocates, would probably counter me saying that and say, they're not failures, Kath. But there were moments where I've, I've had to sort of, things didn't go the way I planned. And I had to say, OK, what am I doing now? Or, um, or I was just very unhappy, and I needed to shift. Um, and in my mind, I kept cataloging them as failures. Um, and so I think one of my biggest um, lessons learned this summer has been that you shouldn't let other people define what is a failure or a success for you. I love that. Like, I and love that, that never dawned, until this summer, and it was just this crazy moment. And maybe for some of you it's, it's not that crazy, but for me that was the most interesting thing because I was like, oh yeah, like they can think it's a failure and who cares? Because if I know I'm moving to something, you know, that's good. Now, sometimes there's a failure and there's something, like, really bad that does happen and you have to figure it out, you have to navigate it, or you have to, um, you know, make amends. But I think a lot of things that happen in our day-to-day -day lives, we just sort of, at least I know, I'm very harsh on myself and I just think, oh, failed on that, failed on that. And that's just not necessarily true. So, um, yeah, I think this topic is hugely important. I have yeah. two younger sisters and I think the more we can talk about these things with each other, uh, the more liberating it is. Um, so I make a point of calling my two sisters whenever I'm having a bad moment to tell them, which they like sometimes don't care. But, um, or they're like, okay, what, what do, you, do you need something from me? And I'm like, no, 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 I just want you to know, like, just like the good moments are great to share on Instagram and stuff, you know, oh, new job or this. Um, the bad moments are equally as important. Yeah. So. Thank you, and yeah. thank you for being so transparent about that, because yeah. I know a lot of us in this room have probably had a moment like that, like, holy moly, what am I doing? Um, so thank yeah. you for sharing that. I think that's awesome. Um, and I loved your quote, never let someone else uh, define failure or success for you. I'm going to make that a quote, or we need like a tile on that, or maybe a tech background. That's kind of amazing. Um, so <laughs> stealing that. I um, stole it from someone else, so you better well, say anonymous. Fantastic. <laughs> that's a great sound bite. Um, she works in comms. Of course she has great sound bites. Um, let's lift this conversation back up again. And no, no, no. And that's not that, because those things are okay. It's, we should talk about this. We actually have to talk about that more. Um, but what I also want to talk about, and this is something that came up in a lot of readers as well, is about mentorship and leadership. And so I think especially if you're an entrepreneur or self-employed, how do you get mentorship if it's not in a corporate setting? So Maddie, I think you could be great at helping us answer that question as someone who started her business from the ground up. How did you get mentorship and advice? Because you're not automatically surrounded by a network of women or men in a corporate environment. Can you guys hear me now? So for me, I realized because I don't have the luxury of being at a nine to five, I really had to maximize these little pockets of moments, whether it was instances like this. And so I remember I went to a panel similar like to this and Stacy Ferguson, who uh, used to put together this uh, blog conference called Blogalicious, it was like the 
first really like black and Latina and like blogger influencer kind of conference space and she was just killing it. She was getting sponsorships from like State Farm and McDonald's and I was like, yeah, I need to talk to her because uh, <laughs> she's getting coins and I like coins. And, uh, and so, you know, and I was very authentically and organically engaging with her brand anyway. So it wasn't like I just like saw her and was like, oh, do you want to, can, can you be my mentor? But I just naturally engaged with her over the last few months and went up to her and I was like, I love everything you're doing. I need you to be my mentor. I know that's aggressive, but this so is how urgent. For it. Yeah, yeah, I just you went just up went to her. Yeah, I think what happens sometimes is like a lot of times we don't think that we belong in certain rooms or certain spaces or somebody's too high for them to mentor us. And you really have to reject that. Like, I definitely thought I was a crazy person when I asked her, but she said yes, and she mentored me for a year. And it was really, really, the timing couldn't have been perfect because six months later, I got let go from my job and transitioned full time into blogging. So that advice was super huge. I mean, she gave me so much advice on how to create streams of income, you know, what these options were. And so honestly, you just have to put yourself out there, ask, really put yourself in rooms that do make you feel uncomfortable, even if you think you don't belong there, it will really, really transform, you know, your whole situation. I think that's really, really important. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. I think uh, that is great advice. Just go out and ask for it. Um, certainly, the networking hour might feel a little comfortable after this. Hopefully, the Prosecco will help. Um, but as I look around, there's a lot of potential for mentorship here, which is great. So thank you for sharing that story. And that's super bold. I love it. You just go for it. Um, Allison, I'd love for you to talk to us about, because um, I think what's interesting is you manage a team remotely to a degree. And leadership is something that we talk a about a lot in the corporate world. But also, leadership is really important if you are a, a small business owner, an entrepreneur, your teams might not actually be right next to you. So how do you lead and motivate your teams from afar? I'm definitely still working on it, but um, I try and pull from leaders that I've had in the past that I really, ex or I really just admired and felt less like they were a leader and more like they were part of the team. So no job is ever too small for me. And because I started and I was the only employee, I've done everything. And so I have the appreciation for the time that it takes to put into something and how much work it is and how emotional it can be to give yourself to something that someone then comes back and says X, Y, and Z is wrong. And so I always, as a leader, try to put myself in my fellow team members position and then always pitch in. And the only tricky thing about being away is that you never have to let, you can never let the fact that you're not there mess with your confidence. So like a lot of people could be like, I'm not there, what am I missing out on? I'm not missing any meetings. I'm on every call. I'm messaging people. I'm talking to them. I want to know, and I'm asking, and I'm engaging. And even if it's a small task and I can do it from my house rather than in Chicago, I'm trying to do it, and I'm trying to help. And then I also always try to tell my employees thank you because I think one of the biggest things, and it's so hard when you're getting into the day-to-day -day thing, is to stop and tell someone, like, Thank you for taking care of that. Thank yeah. you for doing that for me and engaging them in a positive way where you're also lifting them up while also just acknowledging the work that they've done yeah. creates such a good team vibe that it's like you could be elsewhere and it doesn't matter. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, I want to get to two more questions um, before we would open up to Q&A. So Elena, I think what we've heard today is <laughs> We're all busy people. <laughs> These ladies on stage certainly are really busy. You guys are all busy. You guys lead multiple lives, whether it's being a professional, being a mom, being a wife, being a sister, a friend. Um, so Elena, given that you're about to uh, be a mom of two, uh, you're running a company, uh, and on top of that, I'm sure you're a fabulous friend um, to many people, as well as a mentor and leader. What do you say to people that say, you can't have it all? Or do you believe that you can't have it all? We'll just love your take on this. Um, I think I think you can, ugh, that's a tough question. <laughs> I think Coco Safe said space. it best Safe earlier, space. like something's gotta give. Um, you have to choose your top priorities and know that that is gonna get your all. Um, 
for me right now, that's family, the every girl, family, and my husband. Um, I mean, those are the, the big ones, are my job and my family. My social life is in the pits right now. My, my, but my, I've had my closest friends for forever. Um, I'm not doing as much networking as I did three, four years ago. Like I'm not at events all the time out in Chicago like I would love to be or, and like I used to be. Um, my workout regimen doesn't exist right now. So like things have to give and that time is now spent with my son and my husband and I wouldn't trade it for the world. Um, do I want to find ways to maybe once I'm not, you know, in, in better, if I could go for a jog with my son in a you know, like that, for various reasons, I, I can't at the moment. But, um, you know, try to make things happen at the same time. I know all my close girlfriends like to do workout classes together, so they're getting two things in at once. Um, but something does have to give. That being said, y if you want to do it and if you love it, you find the time for it. Yeah. Um, so pretty much every night I'm still on my computer in some capacity working on my own personal blog in addition to the every girl which we're doing all day long and a lot of times at night as well um, but that also is has gone to the you know it's not yeah. what it needs to be to be a consistent blog like that is pretty much posting every day of the week um, so that's kind of gone the way of a hobby yeah. for me as instead of what it used to be yeah. which was a, another side business. Yeah. Um, but what's interesting is even just hearing you answer that question, at least two things strike me. One, when you talk about your family and your son and your husband, like your face just lights up. Um, and second, You're the best. Um, no, honestly. And here's the thing it's okay to let some of that go, yeah. right? I think that's the thing that um, one of the things I've talked about with my team is uh, work life balance. I hate that balance word <laughs> because the reality is it's a rhythm. We're in rhythms where it's high, it's low, it's high, it's low. And I think in those rhythms, especially with what you're going through, it's okay. It's okay to let some things go for a little bit and maybe you get back to it later. And that's totally fine because we're constantly growing and evolving and changing. And that's beautiful. And right now, if that time is every girl and your family, so be it. And, Own it. Love and it. For what it's worth, um, I did launch it, the, the site uh, when I was 26. I, this was always kind of my plan. Was like I knew I wanted uh, to have kids one day, so I need to work my butt off now when I don't have a kid to be up with. Like if I can work from 7 a.m. to midnight launching this thing and doing two jobs and making it happen, like now is the time in my life when I am working, yes. working, 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 working. Um, I couldn't do this if it was, like, we now have a team of 12 full-time employees, and yeah. we still have dozens of writers around the country, and we would not, Danielle, we always said Danielle and I, my co-founder and I both had our first children last child last year, and the year before, we wouldn't have been able to take a maternity leave, yeah. but because our team was able to grow and we had the infrastructure in place to, to, to make sure there was an article on the site every yep. day. Um, so we worked really hard to get to the place. And honestly, I, I did wait longer than, I don't know if I would have had a kid earlier necessarily, but it, it was postponed because I wasn't in a place in my life where I was yeah. able to, yeah. to give both. And that's okay. And yeah, so and you're proud you of know, it. timing, future yeah. planning, thinking about what you want down the road, making things happen now, not waiting. Yeah. I mean, all of that is, it, to your very first yeah. question of like, how do you weigh the risk? I'm like, because yeah. it's now or never. Yeah. <laughs> that and there's just a beauty it. in owning that part of your life, whatever part of life you're in right now, um, and celebrating that. So right. thank you for sharing that so honestly. So this is going to be the last question for the panel, and I'd love for everyone on the panel um, to answer this one quickly. Um, what's the one thing that you would tell your younger self today? So let's start with... <laughs> Kath, do you want to go first? Uh, sure. Um, I'll, I'll fudge it, and I'll two things. Um, I would say I would tell my younger self to be more authentic and to worry less. Um, I, I, I think the thing that people, when I meet new people in life, personal, professional, new family, extended family, in-laws, People value being real. Um, and it doesn't even always matter what you're saying. Like, if you're saying something that's genuine and true and real and sometimes vulnerable, and you're showing that you're human, that immediately, barriers break down, people just latch onto it. And so I think 
we all, I've, I've personally spent a lot of time kind of trying to say the right thing and, and then it loses its genuineness. And yep. so I think, um, I think for me that that's, yeah, that's awesome. key. Thank you. Uh, quickly, Maddie, what would you tell your younger self? Not to copy off a of calf, but. <laughs> you know, be yourself. I think that, because it really is about, this is what I would tell like my 16 year old self. It's about who you are, not what you do. Because in hindsight, like anywhere you put me, I'm gonna be a star. So whether I'm an influencer or girl I work part-time at Target, a young thug's gonna be flourishing. Like I'm just, you know what I mean? Like that's just, Love. that's just what I do. I just approach everything with this kind of tenacity and kind of work ethic and, and excellence that I'm kind of just like, I wanna flourish, I wanna make people feel good. Um, and that used to be something like I shied away from for a long time, but that's part of who I am. So it's really about who you are, not what you do, but then who you are will absolutely directly affect what you do. I love that, that was another quote. That needs to be another tech template. Um, so Allison, what would you tell your younger self? I would say if you have a doubt about anything in your life, whether it be the boyfriend, the job, where you're living, your hair, whatever it is, don't ignore it and just push forward because you're like, well, I've spent all this time doing X, Y, and Z. There's no better time to change and pivot and shift and just go into something else than right now and maybe you put it off for six months, for a year, don't look at what you could have done, look at what you can do now. So if that doubt is still there, that's you telling you there's something better for you. And I promise you, no matter what it is, it's there and you can't even imagine what it is yet. I love that, thanks. Coco? <laughs> um, so I think it's very closely related to uh, being authentic and being true to yourself, but I would almost take that one step further to really thinking about what your value is. Um, I've had a lot of people DM me and be like, oh, how do I get brands to work with me? Or how do I like, get all of the awesome opportunities that you know, they see other influencers getting online? And I think that that's, you almost have to like, ha switch. You have to switch something in your mind. You, going into anything, whether you're starting a business or going into work every day, yes, the salary and the benefits and the perks of it are great, but if you're not offering some sort of value to your company, to your followers, to your potential customers, they're not gonna see a reason why they should be giving you those perks in the first place. So think about what that value is and really, really push that because that's always what's gonna set you apart. Um, I always feel like for a lot of these career things, whenever like events like this come to Atlanta, I love that like Maddie and I somehow always reconnect at things like this and I think that we're both doing that really well, really differently, but really, really well. Um, and I think that just finding your value and what it is and really pushing that is what's gonna set you apart. That's awesome, thank you. All right, Elena, bring us home before we hand the mics over to the audience. All right, I have one bit of pragmatic advice that I wish 22-year-old Elena knew. Um, sign contracts. For every job, whether you are hiring or being hired, make sure expectations are laid out and that you are both signed on the dotted line because I hear of companies getting burned by promises influencers made. I hear of influencers getting burned by companies who promise to pay sooner or send X, Y, and Z or promote them. Um, and not just influencer-wise, obviously. Just always make sure expectations are laid out that everyone knows before you move forward on the work. I, people put in hours of work and then they're like, oh, actually our budget chain never changed, never mind. So protect yourself. Don't be shy about wanting a contract. It could be a simple one pager you put up in Word, put a line at the bottom with your names and sign it. So it'll save you a lot of the headaches in the end and the, you know, prevent those fails and falls that we were talking about, which are good learning experiences, but you can also just <laughs> take mine and do contracts. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Um, so now we're going to open up to questions to you guys. A lot of the questions we try to answer came from a lot of the readers. Some of you guys may have submitted. But we also want to give a chance for you guys to ask the panelists questions today if you have them. So Allie will take the mic. And please introduce yourself. It makes networking easier later. <laughs> Hi, ladies. I'm Anastasia. I'm from Central Florida. Came here because this is amazing with my little friends. Um, from a personal development perspective, so I just see so many boss ladies on the stage and in this room. 
What is one word that maybe could, that you either set at the beginning of the year, like a word of the year, or maybe just through your year have noticed it kind of a trend? I would just love to know like one word that you're either focused on or, you know, whether it's courage or boldness or whatever that is. Who wants to take this one? For me, the word is harvest because um, I'm currently what I would consider a harvest season. Um, I'm pregnant with my third child. I literally moved out of my first home literally yesterday at 6 p.m. Um, it's not feeling too harvesty because I'm living in my in-law's basement for four weeks, but you know, we're about to move into our second home, which is like triple the size of where we came from. My, this is definitely the, the most profitable year as an influencer for me. Um, this year is kicking my butt. Um, harvest, I think sometimes just like, I think initially when I like, you know, was kind of like praying and meditating about it, I was like, oh, this is going to be good. So many things are going to come to me. And when you graduate to a new level, that does require a new mindset, a new work ethic, and just a lot more responsibility. Like, you know, tripling the size of your house is cute, and tripling your mortgage is also not so cute, you know? <laughs> so I think that's the thing that I've been really focusing on. It's like, yes, leveling up is awesome, but do you have the mindset to stay there, right? Because you can get there. It's staying there that is, is really, really tough. So yeah. So you're harvesting the grit that you put in to absolutely, make Absolutely, absolutely. Love that. Do we have another question? Hello, I'm Rosie. Um, besides the obvious answers of the every girl and Beyonce, um, <laughs> where do you guys turn for inspiration? Who wants to take that one? Uh, so I'll try to make this quick so we can have other answers too. Um, so when I look to for inspiration, because like as an influencer, it's a very visual, um, it's, ve it's a very visual job at the end of the day. Um, Instagram obviously is like a big thing. Uh, and when I'm thinking about the kind of content that I'm producing, I'm always thinking about how to keep it aspirational as well as inspirational. So finding that balance. And at the end of the day, when you think of, you know, things like the every girl, <laughs> Beyonce to a certain <laughs> degree too. But then when you, but that's the thing. No, but when you do think about like people who stick out in your mind, they are that perfect mix. Like I think of Michelle Obama, she's a paragon. But then you also feel like you can listen to her and feel like you're you can talk to her as a friend. And I think that that's you know, the kind of person that any woman really wants to be, especially any woman that's building a platform. So um, for me, it's really looking at um, those inspirational women. Okay, uh, yes, other, I look to creative women who I really admire, and they're across all kinds of fields. Um, I love interior design. I follow Shay McGee and Studio McGee, if you follow them. I love following Mindy Kaling and love seeing how her career has, continues to grow and pivot. She's a producer now. She was a writer, actress, all of it. Um, so seeing that like I, I love seeing their careers grow and, and like I said, pivot. Um, I get a lot of inspiration from that. Like you are never just in one thing. Like you can always expand or go in a different direction. And knowing that and not being afraid, like if something isn't working at this new thing you're starting, be willing to pivot. The influencer industry has changed time and time again. Instagram didn't exist when we launched The Every Girl, which is crazy. It was all about Pinterest. Um, knowing whether we needed to be on Snapchat. Okay, let's try it. This isn't working. Back away, back away. Like. <laughs> <laughs> always be willing to pivot and go in a new direction if what you're trying isn't working. So I definitely look up to other women whose careers I admire, whose work they produce I admire. Um, and be willing to unfollow or at least mute those accounts that are bringing you down. Because Instagram is such an amazing source of inspiration if you use it to your advantage and not your detriment. So I mute, I, I will probably say I mute. Like I'm like, done with this, this isn't helping me anymore. I'm not getting anything out of this anymore. Um, don't be afraid to do that. No one's offended. Like, there's too many people in the world. Life's too short to be offended by that kind of stuff. So, yeah, do what works for you. So, I'm Caitlin. I came from Tennessee. So, my question is, like many of you up there that I just learned, I recently made the change from journalism into content marketing. 
So other than like networking and conferences and things like that, what are the things you did to really hone in skills? Many of those skills transfer over, but like to continue to grow in a completely new career in a shift like that. Hi. <laughs> um, so I always look at who is 10 steps ahead of me or who is where I want to be. And then instead of copying them, I look at what they're doing, why do I think that they're doing it, and like what am I responding to as an individual? So for example, when I first started full time at the Every Girl and Paid, I was like, Refinery29 is doing this, this, and this. And I think Elena and Danielle were like, yeah, and they have 300 employees, like <laughs> calm down. But I was like, if we could take one thing that they're doing, they're thinking on a bigger scale, so I always try and think, what could I be doing that's bigger than just what I'm doing now? So looking at someone else and saying, they're doing this, why are they doing this? Should I be doing this? Is this right for me? And then figuring out how to do it. And that actually prompted the Facebook like incentive that I put on where I was like, we should be posting like this and we should be doing things this way. And that tripled our traffic and allowed us to bring on employees, which grew our company. And it was just me before then, and it was just a wild hair I got. So I always think that like looking at where you want to be, and rather than thinking there are so many steps to get there, it's like, what are they doing? How can I do that on my budget? Do I need to YouTube? Do I just need to watch them? What is it? Really quick, I just want to say another thing, um, this applies to entrepreneurs and corporate and kind of no matter where you are. Um, Allison's always been really incredible at presenting ideas that, remember I said we've always been very cons played it safe and conservative, um, or tried something and didn't see a result. And she's like, and she'll pitch it and we're like, we've tried it, it doesn't work. And she's like, I'm going to make it work. And, the, and sh she does. So, like, I guess my advice is the pushback against management and your boss. Like, if you see something and you're just being told, no, 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 we don't have the time, we don't have the assets. Like, if you really know that it's going to be fruitful in, in some capacity, um, find a way to, like, one, push back or two, at least give yourself some time and, and to, to prove that, like, no, I'm right about this. Like, I can make this happen for you. And it's just kind of crazy you see that, like, you're just proving yourself. You're putting yourself in a better position of your worth. Um, you can add that accomplishment to your resume. Um, so don't get too discouraged by yeah. hearing no or an unsure response from management yeah. because trust yourself and trust your gut. She's yeah. done it repeatedly for our small company. Yeah. And sometimes we're it's very grateful. Packaging it up differently, right? Maybe you package it up this way, reframe it, and serve the same up idea up again and package it differently. I know that happens a lot in the corporate world. I think the other thing I would say just from a marketing perspective is just know your audience, um, who you want to serve, have a clear idea of who that consumer is or who that woman is that you want to inspire. Maybe it's a man, I don't know, maybe it's a pet. Um, but just know your audience and, and what they want. And I think that in itself, just doing research on that helps with your content marketing as well. Any other questions from the audience? Ooh, we have a lot. Maybe yes. One more. Maybe one more. And then come find us at networking so we can answer your question. Yeah. Hi, I'm Julie. I work in PR. Um, my question is, I think all of us in this room, whether we're a woman or a color or queer, all have a sense of being underestimated when we walk into the room or that feeling of not belonging. So, of course, it's great and inspiring for us to hear that we do fit in and we do belong and have access to mentorship, but what are some practical ways that we can really push ourselves to our limits, past our boundaries, to a place where we feel safe and being vulnerable and authentic? Does anyone want to take this? I can also do that a little bit. Yeah. Go. Um, so I think that, I, I love that question, by the way, because it's something that I asked myself when I started out blogging. Um, back in 2013, and even to a certain extent now, uh, especially when you're looking at the fashion influencer space, it still is very, very insular, mm -hmm. very specific type of girl that you know they're going with, whether it's size, race, you know, where it is you're coming from. And for me, you know, when I thought about what space I want to occupy as an influencer, like what would, some of the things that I thought to myself is, what, how, A, how do I 
create a brand that would be able to fit into that space while also still keeping true to who I am. But then also on the other end, it was really important for me to get an understanding of who are the actual decision makers on the other side. Um, and connecting with them really is one of the big things I think that has helped me. I always knew from the jump, especially you know because I'm not at a million whatever followers, but working with the right agencies, the right talent managers. Um, I recently started working with a brand manager and she used to book a lot of like the really big campaigns that girls were booking when they started out too. And so just really creating some of those real relationships in the background that may not always necessarily you know, turn around and be what puts you at the top right away, but I think really it sets such an important foundation or down the road when some of those decisions are being made and they're like, hey, do you know of anyone? It's like, oh, I know Coco. I've worked with her for the past so and so many years. And I think by creating some of those relationships in a more personal way, it helps you to kind of establish yourself beyond you know, what it is you look like because those people know who you are as a person. And um, from more of a corporate perspective, I think What's amazing is that probably each and every person around you is having some sort of feeling that's similar, whether it's just flat out imposter syndrome or um, I used to be way blonder and I swear that I would walk in a room and people would just dismiss me because I was blonde and a, a woman. And um, so I, I think like remembering that everybody around you is feeling that way. And actually to your point around, I. I love, I love networking as a concept, but I actually, in my mind, don't always think about it as networking. I think about it as relationship building because I, the people that I've met over the years have become, they're friends, they're also career advocates, they're people that we give each other jobs. I mean, we don't give, we all earn what we get, but we network when we're looking for the next thing or when somebody's out of a job. Um, and so I think that that can also really help even in within your corporate setting. I don't know if you're corporate or not, but um, having those key friendships that are also, um, you know, kind of advo advocates for you. Um, but I've, I, I, like I said, I think we've all been there. I've totally been there. I've had jobs where I literally had to take a walk every day just to like feel like, okay, I'm, I'm good with myself again before I go back in. Um, and uh, it doesn't mean it was a bad environment even, but sometimes the competitiveness can be really tough. Um, and, uh, you know, I think we can be the change. I really do. Like, I, I try to seek people out um, who I notice maybe aren't um, commingling or, or just aren't being yep. boosted yeah. and just say that one thing um, that, that can help lift. But yeah. it is tough. Yeah. Thank yeah. you for sharing that. And can I just add this one thing? So sorry. I know our time is <laughs> cut. Um, just a couple off of what Coco and Kath said. I think if you layer those two things and then on top of that, you ask for what you want. A lot of us are not asking for what we want because we assume that they're not going to give it to us. And I think it is, it's about the ask for sure. You know what I mean? You want to make sure you are extra polished. You know what I mean? Because if you are a minority in whatever case, like you, your I's got to be dotted, your T's got to be crossed. But when you ask for what you want like for me the thing that was huge and uh, a mentor of mine um, a white mentor of mine was like you you have to think about what your male or even what your white counterpart would be willing to ask for are you approaching that situation like that and that really changed the game for me as far as how much money I started making as an influencer because I would always go in like, well, hopefully they'll work with me because I'm in Atlanta and I'm black and I'm a millennial. And it was just like, but are you aware of the value, right? Like Coco said, I think that was really huge. So I think it is all about the relationship building and all of that. But once you get that advice, definitely take it, internalize it, be confident, and though go ask for what you want. Awesome. Well, first of all, I just want to thank all you ladies on stage for being so candid and for sharing all your wisdom with everyone. So if we could just give them a hand of applause, that's amazing. Um, and again, want to thank you guys for being here. And also want to thank you for being so engaged uh, with the discussion and asking questions. So at this time, I'd actually love to raise a toast. So if everyone can grab their Lamarca minis. Um, Here's a cheers um, to all of us and to all of you in the room. Um, 
It's been such an incredible journey for us to be able to put this conference together. We are so privileged that you guys drove from afar to come join us and be here with us. So here's cheer to, cheers to you and cheers to always rising um, as women in the workforce. So thank you. Cheers. Yeah.